because I want to talk about something that was kind of on my mind as to how this can work. And then at the end, if you will allow, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about a real life thing that demonstrates these principles that I'm talking about. And maybe it's something that at least in uh, in certain countries might be useful again. You never know. So I'll explain what I mean. We're going to talk about sideways prospecting and we're going to talk about reverse prospecting or really there's another name for it. So let's jump into that. And uh, I'm going to be straying away from the comments for just a minute. So I'll come back and do the Q&A portion of this maybe in just a little bit. So what do I mean? What what are we talking about when we talk about sideways prospecting? Okay. So you're a digital marketer. You're a agency owner, perhaps. You're a freelancer, perhaps. Uh, maybe you're all three. I don't know. Uh, some people really think they're all three. Uh, that's you know that's been me at times. Uh, but you have strengths, right? And uh, things that you do well. I know. Every, I hear you out there. Everybody does everything that's possibly needed in digital marketing, and they're an absolute pro at it to your customers. BS. You don't. And I don't. And nobody else does. However, we do have things that we're good at. We do have things that we're that we we enjoy. We do have things that are, you know, that, that we really thrive on doing. We would rather do those to help a client. I mean, we love seeing a client succeed, okay? Or we love seeing a, a problem solved. Maybe that's our motivation. But we have certain things that we're that we're coming from a place of that we're really good at. Okay. And and those are um, you know, those are those are things that, like, for example, mine is go high level. And mine is also because I've spent a, done some very, very deep dives into go high level. And do I know it absolutely 100% as good as the founders and as good as the high level people who run go high level, the company? No, I don't. But I'm about 90% there. Uh, there's, I start running into issues with the APIs and things like that, that I'm not as good as I would like to be at it. And there's other things too. Can I design a website? Yes, but I, I bring in people who can do it better. So, and that kind of is to my point here. So there's, there's things that I am weak at that I'm not as good at. I've done SEO. I'm not good at it. There are, that is a, that's a truly unique gift to do SEO well. Same with the ads. I, can I do the ads? Yes, I can do the ads. I know how they work. I know how to get them there. But I also know people who have, who are much better at getting those results. So just like me, you are a you're a marketer with strengths and you're a marketer with weaknesses and you are a marketer with a circle of influence okay you have there are people and if you're not doing this you should be doing this uh, where you are networking with other individuals who are doing marketing you're not there to sell them you're there to connect with them uh, you are there to to make those inroads maybe a sacrifice a little bit maybe you don't uh, to to really get that going, and so then you are you are working with getting to know those people just like you would in any other job. It's expand your network. Please don't do what I've done for the past fifteen years. Okay, I did not expand my network like I should have. I did not spend my time developing those contacts and diving into those industries. Honestly, until I got into marketing. Uh, before that, I really didn't do a good job of it. Okay. Uh, so don't be me, you know, do those things, really work to expand that network. You're not there to pitch somebody. You're there to to make that connection. And you're there to be just a little bit vulnerable about the things that you're good at and the things that you're not so good at. So you have that you have that circle of influence you build up. Now, here's where the magic happens. OK, you have skills. Your friends that you just networked with who are also digital marketers have certain skills. If you do it right and if you're paying attention, they complement each other. And so maybe, just maybe, you can find somebody who has a, who has strengths that you don't or maybe has a client niche they're trying to serve, but they need help with something that you're good at or vice versa. You've got a client niche you're trying to serve. And, and then you have to go out and, and, and figure out how to do some of these things that you're not good at. Well, what if you pulled along somebody from your circle of influence as a fellow marketer and you guys did a collaboration to solve a problem? It solves a problem for one or both of you. 
and it gets you exposure and it gets you notice and maybe it just it gets you into a niche that you weren't and, and a group of people that you weren't planning on but you're there and you're making inroads and it's good you may you may very well discover that you are uh, that you're that you're you you enjoy that group more than you thought you would because that wasn't really the place you wanted to start and it's not always a niche maybe you back out a little bit maybe it's a you know it's a it's a broader group of people but you know through the leveraging the power of your friend and your connection you just made and you spent time nurturing and putting that together and seeing how it works uh, you you then have exposure to areas that you wouldn't already. And I know there's one person out there watching this who we just had that discussion. So <laughs> there you go, bud. So uh, so yeah, that's this is a this is a learning thing. This is a l connecting thing. This is a this is working out the differences because there will be. It's it's you know trying to put those things together, but it's very very worth doing. It's not the partnerships your business school warned you about. Okay? They tell you don't do partnerships. They really do. But collaborations are a totally different animal. Uh, they haven't have outs for everybody, but don't plan on using them. Don't be looking to use them. So that is sideways prospecting. If you take some time doing that, I hate to give away all my secrets because that's a lot of what I do. Guys, I'm here to tell you. And I'm having success with it. Um, but that is really a, that is something that you can, if you'll take the time to do it and do it well, um, it doesn't completely mitigate your need to look in the niches that you're looking for or to look at the, the overall look for the types of clients that you're looking for, but it sure makes it easier because then you can go with confidence, uh, knowing that you can offer services that you couldn't offer before because you can, you can pull somebody alongside that you have come to trust. That can handle those for you. And you know what? If it doesn't work out or it nears the end of its relationship, then you you two part ways mutually and hopefully, you know, comfortably without anybody, you know, any any issues or any problems there. And you and you find other people to connect with and you'll change those around and then you'll connect them together. And it's amazing what can happen. So sideways prospecting rocks. I'm here to tell you it absolutely rocks. It's wonderful. So then you can you you get the benefit you get the benefits of having services you don't normally offer and they get the same they get those benefits and and you can share it. so there's just there's so many reasons to do it so it's you know if you don't take anything away from working in marketing because this is unusual this is not this doesn't happen in every uh, in every business section out there it really does you don't see electricians partnering up always. You don't see um, lawyers partnering up, especially not partnering up always sometimes or sometimes they do, you know, but then that's without, you know, business contractual agreements and things like that. Marketers aren't that aren't that stressed about it. Um, have have some outs, have some ways also that, you know, make sure both people are covered and it'll happen and it'll be and it'll probably give you more business than you possibly planned on. So that's a good problem to have. Right. That's sideways prospecting. OK. So let's talk about reverse prospecting, or actually a better name for it would be vertical prospecting. But you know what? Reverse just sounded cool. So I wanted to add it in there, and I thought about it later. It's like, you know, vertical really makes a lot more sense. Okay? This has to do with supply chain. Look at your supply chain of, of the way things happen, and look up and down that supply chain and say, where are there opportunities here to connect with somebody that can help me? Okay, and I'll give you two good examples, right? So let's say you're working with electricians, okay? Or you're working with, yeah, yeah, that's, that's probably a pretty good one. Uh, home services people of any kind, electricians, roofers, plumbers, whatever, uh, countertop people. Um, and, and you are you know, looking to get them customers. OK, so there are all the usual ways that we know how to do this. You know, we make sure their online presence is good. We make sure they're getting good reviews. Uh, they're getting good referrals uh, from from people and they know those are out there. They're sending out occasional messages to their to their current and for, their, their, you know, clients because they're done. I mean, they're still clients because you did work for them. Uh, and the prospects going, hey, do you know of any business? Can you refer somebody my way? You're doing all those good things. Now, 
if you start then looking at, okay, the, the people that you, you're working in a house, chances are there's a general contractor, is there not? Chances are there are plumbers and there are countertop people. Well, if you're a countertop person and there are electricians and there are carpenters and there are people doing other things, drywall people, um, they're working in that, in that building or that house too, correct? Well, maybe they know someone who or a situation that needs a countertop person. Would that make sense? Would that make sense to do? Would that make sense to talk to them to explore those things? Would that make, if they're your client, would that make sense for them to, for you to coach them to start doing, to start doing that outreach with them? Because, I mean, that's, that's, that becomes part of this, you know, who's in the sales, who's in the sales process, who's in the vertical. So it starts being a vertical model that starts at the top with your great big general contractors. And then you start working your way down. And yeah, it's a bit of sideways sometimes too. Who comes before you? Who comes after you in the sales cycle? Who is, uh, who is, who are those companies there? And can you work with them to bring each other business? Can you come alongside them to work? Think about the process by which business happens. Who is before you? Who is after you in, the, in that sales cycle? Who is before you? Who is after you if you're doing home services in that construction cycle? Who is before you or after you as a digital marketer who provides your software? And yes, Go High Level is a very obvious example of that, but that's not the example that I'm heading for, okay? They're, they're a great one. They pay a great commission. They have a, they have a cool affiliate program. They help you to get that affiliate program up and off the ground if, you know, if you're willing to buy into it. So, I mean, you can make there and there are people who make entire businesses out of the, out of the go high level affiliate program uh, or the or the SaaS program that they offer. And uh, where you can set that up as, uh, you know, you become a software provider and you're selling that software. Not everybody's heard of go high level. So that's out there as, a, as an opportunity for you. But let's also think about what is a good tool, say, for doing SEO. What is a good tool for setting up ads and making really, really good ads or making really good videos or something with a, to do with AI? What's a good tool out there that does that? Now, does that have an affiliate program? So two examples I have there. One is called is a software I use to do uh, and, and, and I have before and I will continue to use it. Uh, for to help with SEO to help speed it along, it's called Citation Vault. Uh, they happen to be from very nearby me, where I am in Texas. But they offer it's a service that any place that Google works and is available, this works. And so they basically imagine having 300 short articles written about you in your local directories, in your local in your local presence, and what that will get you. Uh, it's it's pretty impressive results for relatively little money. So if they have an affiliate program, which I actually don't think they do, um, but you can, uh, maybe they do, maybe they have a little something for signing up people, but it's, uh, you can, you can get that from them and you can get started and you can, uh, and you can get a little money for sending business their way. And guess what? You're solving a problem too. And you're, re and you're representing them. Uh, and then they're helping you to tap into areas maybe with other people that come across that maybe it's a tough example because they're probably employed by a bunch of digital marketers. <laughs> but maybe there's a situation where you could you you could get access to other types of clients that might need your marketing services. Perhaps a better example is one that I have come across. Uh, a gentleman has set up a software that's an estimating software for in their first target is roofers. OK, so they they look they do a they have a situation where they've you know, they'll give you give them the dimensions of your roof. They kind of coach you through how to do that. And based on what, you know, you get information, uh, you're say, say you've got this, you're, you're representing roofers and you're running this thing as a marketer. Uh, you get details from your roofing client as to how they would spec something like that out. What's the cost per square foot, that sort of thing. Whenever these people put that in, in order to get that estimate, they have to give up their name, address, and phone number, which comes right to you. Well, guess what? These guys have an affiliate program. 
they have a situation where the, anybody I send to them uh, to sign up the service, they, they give me a little something for doing it. But also the reverse can be true. Maybe they come across roofers over here who, as we develop and we have to develop that relationship, uh, we come across roofers that they say, you know what? We really can use some marketing help over here in, in addition to this estimating business. Do you know, uh, Mr. Software Developer, do you know a good you know, person who can help me get some customers here to use so I can use this estimating tool? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, they do. I know one right over here. And they hand walk them over to you and hand them to you and say, here, this person really, this, this business really needs some help. They're already using our service. So they're familiar with the estimating and what that looks like. But they also need help getting those customers and closing those deals, closing those sales. So that's how vertical marketing works. It's, it's your, your top down and down to up. It's looking who's before you and looking who is after you. Okay. So I hope those are two things you might not have thought about when you're, when you're doing your prospecting, when you're doing, when you're out there looking for what you do, what are the people, the marketers in this case that are sideways of you? Um, and, and what, how can they help you to get more customers with, with people you don't normally serve or, or in services you don't normally offer? And then in a vertical sense for you, or probably better for your coaches or for your, for your clients, um, you, who comes before you, who comes after you in the sales chain? Who's, who's somebody you can connect up with and foster a relationship with? that can help bring you more customers in ways that you couldn't do because they don't, you don't have access to those, to those people, but they do or vice versa. You know, if you're, if you're, if you have, you know, places where you can share people who have needs and you connect up with somebody who can provide those needs, you know, you can give each other clients. That's wonderful. That's a great way to, to get that business back and forth and take care of each other. So I hope that works for you. Um, and I and I have a really good example of that, and it's a little involved. Uh, at some point, I may publish this out there in in the world uh, on on the Facebook proper and out of this group. Uh, and the person who is the architect of this and was sought nationwide in the United States to make this happen uh, actually is a friend of mine. So <laughs> we'll see if he follows and says, "John, you didn't quite get it right," because he might. Uh, but really, really good guy. Um, but let me tell you the story of what actually happened to us. And it's a program we were involved with probably 15 years ago now. Um, and it got canceled by stupid politics. Pure and simple, stupid politics. Okay? Regardless of, so regardless of where you, you fall in the social justice category of things, um, there, there are situations where this can be beneficial. You talk about the supply chain and talk about finding opportunities for the supply chain to help you. Uh, so we were a trailer manufacturer. And so these are big flatbed trailers, big, big, big things. Um, and, and over the road that are pulled by trucks and you haul freight on them, right? We also did something called container chassis. So you, you know what a shipping container is. So when it's not being, when that container is not being hauled on a train or hauled on a ship, they put it on a frame and attach it to it that looks like a, a, the, the skeleton of a trailer. So a truck can hook up to it and pull it around. Okay, that's called a container chassis. Uh, so we were manufacturing those and we're looking for ways to, you know, always improve that process, always improve that supply chain. And we had some good things going. We were working with, uh, you know, a, comp a company that was out of country and that sort of thing. Then we came across an opportunity. And it was here in the United States inside prisons. Okay. So you, you, you wonder how that all works. How can this possibly be anything? I mean, you, those people are, you know, they did something obviously to be there. And so they, um, and, and, you know, they're, they're really not worth much while they're in there, right? That's the, that's the, that's the, you know, the, the, the vision everybody has of people in prison and perhaps in most, in many cases it's earned. Um, however, uh, a gentleman had come up with a program and, it, and has become the, or it's actually, it's a federal United States 
federal program. It's probably still on the books called Prison Industry Enhancement. Okay. So it's probably still there. You can probably Google it. Uh, I didn't before I started this, but I'll bet you could. And it's, it is available to any state in the United States who wants to run it at the state level, at the state prison level. So they, now there are rules that govern what they can make, but it's for manufacturing and reconditioning of things. And there are rules around what they can recondition and manufacture. In fact, they're better at reconditioning instead of manufacturing. And that has to do with the contact level of contact that the business who's sponsoring this has with them and the level of influence uh, with, with the people to do this. So it is set up that they, the way our particular one is set up, to not to go too far into the details, uh, it was here in Texas at, at uh, prisons that were here. And they would assemble these chassis and trailers that came over that were from, from our supplier who was in China. They would put everything together. Uh, the, the frame was already there. So they would add the, 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 the wheels and the chassis and everything. Or the, I'm sorry, the base uh, axles and everything to it and finish it out and get it ready to go. They even got to where they could actually build a flatbed trailer if we needed it, you know, and did for us. In many in many cases, and there's some kind of amusing stories about some of that sometimes about these experiences that these guys had. Well, and then when it came time to, uh, so you think, well, you see, I see all those movies about prisoners working on the side of the road and busting rocks, and that certainly that certainly does happen. Uh, there's a version of that that you know that they that they end up doing where they just they're out you know weeding in the fields and chopping stuff and, you know, and just being, you know, busting rocks and doing all that. But to get to this program, to work for, to work for these companies, they have to be allowed by the, they have to meet certain qualifications and then they have to be allowed by the prison wardens to even, to even think about this, to even interview for this job. Once they are allowed, it actually became a real job interview. So they would come in and depending on their skill set, they would actually interview for the jobs with us, uh, with our representatives and with uh, and with the, the, the prisons would uh, allocate special people who had some training uh, to work with us, to, to come alongside us and, and help us manage this, help us manage the, the, the work teams and the facilities that are because we were setting up inside the prison. So it was managing the facilities just as much as the work teams and their communications there. They, they can't call out. Matter of fact, we had it. We wrote up at one point, once we got more comfortable with them, this job description and, uh, you know, must be able to travel, must be able to spend nights and do all this other stuff and just completely tongue in cheek, amusing. Uh, but in, and, and the, the guys saw it, the, the, the men in white, the offenders saw it and they, uh, they, they thought it was hilarious because they, they, they knew where they were and they knew what they were, you know, and they knew why they were there. And many of them would tell you if you got to know them. So just be prepared for that answer. <laughs> uh, but it's generally doing something to to, to be there. So uh, they would, uh, but once once it got time, they would actually get paid for the work that they did. They would get paid an hourly wage. And so the miss, the the thing that didn't quite get out there was we actually paid over and above minimum wage the minimum national wage for the skill set in that area. So whatever a welder made in East Texas, we actually had to pay uh, per hour. And we usually added, we added a little bit, um, it turned out, just for good measure. So, so there was no cheap abused labor. There's no, none of that. Now, when they did get paid, it would go through this chain of things were siphoned, money was siphoned off before it ever got to them for all the right reasons uh it was it was there was a crime victims fund that they a general fund that they would put into if they owed any restitution for their crimes if they owed any any monies for damages they caused or whatever then then that got taken out if they owed child support that got taken out uh and then at the end uh, uh, part of their housing and to and to fund the program that got taken out and when it finally and then two more stops for them uh, for that money before it got to them or one, they could designate one dependent on the outside. Uh, maybe that was their son or daughter. Maybe that was their, maybe that was their spouse, their wife. Maybe that was whatever. They could designate 
one person that would get a piece of their wages. And so that was our job was to call was to administer the, you know, the, the program on the outside, uh, you know, to to set up the you know, get the work for them to do for what they're manufacturing and also to stay in contact with these dependents and tell them why they're getting this money and what it's for and to process those checks, which we would get, you know, we would get uh, money from and we would just we would retransfer them and process them. So we only had one person ter ever turn that down. They just absolutely wanted nothing to do with this guy. And, uh, and, but otherwise, all of a sudden, these guys become part of the family again. Their, their, their daughter needs a dress for prom or for dance. They can do that. Their son, you know, needs something or other for, uh, to play Little League. They can, they can help fund that. They become a part of the family because they're contributing to it again because of their hard work. And so finally, it would get, once that was all accounted for, it would get down to them and it would go into their commissary account where they could go buy things they wanted. So the motivation of these guys was absolutely unreal to do this because one, because they knew the money was going to help fix what they had messed up, but also it was just, it was something for them to do. That was, that was, I mean, it was productive. They got to feel useful. And so regardless of your, your view on social justice, on prison reform, on whatever, this certainly makes it, this makes a compelling argument. Uh, you know, after having gone in there myself and talking to them and working with them, it gives you a little different perspective that's not one that everybody gets. Okay. It really does, it it makes it makes a difference. I mean, most of these guys, they they did something to get there. Okay. So we can all agree on that. And they're, but if you are teaching them a skill or you're they'll work with them if they didn't have the skill to develop it. Uh, and or they already had the skill to begin with, it helps them to feel useful. And so the level of productivity we got out of these guys was absolutely amazing. So two stories there, just to finish this off. One was when we first started, uh, we said, okay, this sounds good. This sounds amazing, but we want to see proof. You know, so they took us to a neighboring prison and worked with a window company who happened to be uh, one of the companies and one of the people that were the businesses that were a part of this program. And we talked to the folks and they said, okay, so we weren't sure about this program either. So when we started in here, we make windows, right? We manufacture windows. So we thought if we could get two windows a day out of this, you know, we would call that successful. Our ones on the outside will do, will do four. So if we can get two out of that, if we can get halfway there, then that's that's OK. It's, it's you know, worth the investment. It's not that big a deal. It's helping them out. So that's cool. So they started with two and that was working so well. They would run out of time. You know, they would run out of, you know, they did finish early in the morning. So four, you know, maybe that's not out of reach. So let's try it. Let's see what happens. So four became not a problem. And while we're doing that, you know, maybe possibly we could do eight in here. You know, if we added a little bit of time or worked it around, so suddenly became eight, suddenly became 16. And so now they are the, that facility was, or at that point, uh, the facility was the most productive facility that this company had for manufacturing windows. Okay. So they were absolutely blown away. So were we, we were absolutely blown away. We want to do this. So so we got that in there. And then one of those amusing stories was we were, uh, so these truck tire, these, these trailer tires that we put on are probably five feet tall. I mean, they're, they're big, you know, when you're, when you're standing by them. And so we, things were going well. They were, everything was getting manufactured and assembled like it was supposed to. They were being very productive. We were very pleased with what we saw. And so we were touring one day and decided, you know what? Um, you know, maybe we could give these guys some help. There's some guys that are that are putting truck tires on uh, on over here on the trailer. I keep calling them truck tires, but they're they're trailer tires. So we uh, we'll, we'll give them some help, right? So we got this very expensive, very very cool tire mounting machine for them. You know, we thought we're doing them a favor, right? So we get this we get this tire mounting machine. And we get it all set up and make a big deal out. Okay, great. So we'll do that. Fine. No problem. Came back three months later and that tire machine is gathering dust over in the corner. He said, okay, now we have a problem, guys. 
this is this is not right. This is what are we doing here? Because we we wanted to, you know, this is really going to help you guys. Why don't you use it? What's the problem? And they, you know, looking at the floor and said, um, sir, with all due respect, it's slow. What do you mean it's slow? It's top of the line machine. What are you doing? Maybe it's just better if we show you. So these these big gorilla guys, <laughs> this became a workout for them, and we didn't realize it. They would go over and get take those tires and boom, put them up on the uh, on the trailers, and they were as much or more secure than they ever were, and they were fast at it. They were absolutely correct. Uh, it was slow for them. So what we thought was going to be something impressive just didn't really help them at all. Uh, so all that is to say. Um, there are opportunities in the woodwork that you don't always know about as far as, you know, business process goes, as far as being on the lookout for vertical prospecting. Now, that program, sadly, became the victim of an, a, a competing company who decided to uh, use us to break their union uh, to, on, the, on the outside. It had nothing to do with us. We invited them completely. We thought this is great. We all can benefit from this. We, even though we're competitors, it's cool. And so they did, they, they came in and then they, they got to be buddies with a, with a state Senator who then at that point came alongside and said, they, so they called us into a meeting a few months later and, uh, and with the, so with this Senator, uh, who happened to be on the board of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, and uh, and and you know, was a part of the, the 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 group that ran that organization from you know even though he was a Texas senator, and he said, okay, so we enjoy a and and we talking to the heads of of you know the the this this uh, PI program, this Prison Industry Enhancement Program. You know, we enjoy a great relationship with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. We in the Senate do, in the Texas government, we, we do. And we will continue to enjoy that relationship if these guys, if those guys are not here pointing to us. I wasn't there, but I, I heard about it happen. And so that was the beginning of the end of a very, very good program. And it continued on for a couple of years, but really wasn't ever the same, at least in the state of Texas. Uh, we tried to the the person that was the the architect of this is consulted nationwide or was at the time. I don't know if he still is um, on these different types of programs. So we tried to constitute it in other places, but it just didn't work the same. And so all that is that we never would have known about that had we not gotten connected with people that were connected with him that knew about this program. That it's you never know where the supply chain is going to come from. You never know where your opportunities are going to be if you're if you're just a little bit creative and you're willing to do something, you know, that you can that you can make that happen. So you, you just never know those things. So I hope this has been you know, along with my my long story hour. There's there's a whole lot more to it. And it's 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 an incredible shame that that got killed for stupid politics because it really did a lot of good for these guys really got to know some of these guys. Uh, and and they they knew their place. They knew they needed to serve their time for what it was they did. But they also had wonderful opportunities to to be useful, to uh, you know show us some things that we didn't always think about. And that's an opportunity lost now because it's not done. So where in the world are you looking to find people? Where are you looking that's above you and below you in your in your sales process? Where are you looking amongst your fellow marketers that are all in this group and every other place for places you could have connections? I challenge you for that. Where are you looking for those? Because if you look hard enough, you will find them. Okay. So let me uh, let me lean in close here and let me have a look at what's in the Q&A for the group here. So forgive me while I do that. And by, gosh, a lot of people. Good grief. Okay. Um, Let's see what we got here. So we have, and and by the way, if you guys would uh, do me a favor in the future, uh, if you would go to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook, streamyard.com forward slash Facebook and sign in there, it actually lets me see who you are uh, and lets me see who, who you are in this, in this particular deal. Okay, so 
All I see is Facebook user, Facebook user, Facebook user. <laughs> so uh, forgive me. So, all right. So um, let's see. So what's, and, and at some point I will, um, I'll go through why I do things this way. There's a, there's a good reason, but that's for another time. What is your take on influencers? My take on influencers is, I guess it depends on the, it depends on the niche. It depends on what it is that you're, that you're trying to accomplish out of it. I think ultimately there are probably better ways of doing that. But if it's a, if it's a real close area and this person has some absolute lock on it, and they're willing to let you come alongside there. And, and I mean, there's obviously fees involved, um, but you can, you can decide whether to do that or not and whether, that, whether what they bring is of value to you. But you might do better just to befriend them and just look for opportunities sort of on the other side that, that not only helps them, but helps you too. You know, instead of you just paying them to, to be an influencer, uh, maybe you find a way to do some business together. Maybe there's something, some direction that they always wanted to go that you know how to do. And so you figure that out together as to how that works. Good question. Good question uh, about it. That's, that's my take. Your mileage may vary. And obviously there are influencers out there who do, you know, who do well and, and who provide good value and who really bring the audience that they say they're gonna bring for a particular purpose. Um, it'd be good to find the ones that are in the niches that you're talking about, that you that you wanna work to instead of a more general approach that's just a celebrity who's you know famous. Maybe it's somebody who's more famous as a, they're a famous chiropractor and you're dealing with chiropractors or they, they're really dropping a lot of good knowledge. Maybe you can find a way to come alongside them and say, you know, hey, is, is there, you know, can I come on and talk to your people about how to can talk to your chiropractors about how to, because, how to get customers? You know, and you tell me how to, how chiropractic can really benefit me. And, and I can, you know, pass that along to the, to the people that I, you know, that I know to, to get you more business. So there's, there's synergies that can happen there. I just have to be a little more open to figuring out what that is. Okay. So let's see. The next question is, <laughs> are you interested in getting any of my, uh, any, any of my network? I don't know. I don't know who you are. So it's, uh, it doesn't say on there. So, um, all right. So, uh, let's see. Some people saying hello. That's good. Hi guys. Thank you for checking in. Um, let's see. Are you new to go high level? Um, I guess relatively speaking, I am. I've only been using it two years, but they have been two deep dive years. So, uh, so yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what that looks like. Um, if somebody is new to go high level, you know, maybe they, maybe you find you can, you probably know you can get lost in it and get lost in what's going on until you, until you figure out a way to make it apply to the real world and you have projects that you can that you can tie it to then it's cool to go back because one of the things go high level does do and and there's debate about this okay i mean there's because it offers lots of funnels it offers lots of newsletters it offers things that are you know set up for specific people and you have folks out there who look and say oh that, those really aren't that good they're you know they're templates from three years ago okay maybe they are take them and make them better you know, take them and make them what you need. But there, it's it's a whole lot easier to edit something than it is to create it from scratch, unless you're just that good. You know, so uh, so that's always a possibility. All right, so we got one more here that kind of got obscured a little. Uh, two more, I'm sorry, that got obscured a little bit. Um, let's see here. Okay, so there's some uh, there's there's some things going on there. Okay, ah, okay, there's some <laughs> some folks sticking up for me. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's there's people prospecting here. Um, okay, guys, 
So we, we try our level best in here to give you other ways of creating, you know, of, of, of finding opportunities instead of just dropping, I can help you with that and all types of, you know, uh, pitching in the group. Okay. Uh, we've, we've kind of shut that down. So, um, so you guys find ways to add value to the group. We've said it many, 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 many times. If not, keep doing it. Find ways to add value to the group. Find ways to add value to your connections. Come to them with opportunities uh, instead of just seeking business from somebody. Oh, I can help you with all that. It's bring them an opportunity that says, hey, I see that you're really good with website design. Well, I'm not as good with website design. And I can find uh, I can find ways to, you know, if I can, if we can work something out here, perhaps, then I can, you know, you can help me with my website design. If you let me help you set up message marketing and referrals for these people, suddenly you have you have a connection instead of just mass pitching everybody. You have an opportunity that you've worked hard to get and you've worked hard to, to, to come across with. So. So, yeah. That's um, I, I appreciate that, but we've uh, we're we're working on ways to to make that to make that happen, to make that a reality, to find to give you alternate ways, and and I hope they I hope they work for you. In fact, why don't, if they have worked for you, success stories? Why don't you put those in the comments here? Why don't you put those as regular posts, and we'll make sure that uh, that they that they get put out there. You know, tell the success story. What have you what have you been able to do when you were when you were collaborating with fellow marketers? What have you been able to do when you start looking at the people who come before you or come after you in the supply chain and the sales process uh, where you can you could do work together that has made some phenomenal results? If you don't want to, you know, really disclose the details of it, don't disclose the details, but just let us celebrate a win with you for a little while. So nothing wrong with that at all. So if you have a win. Post it out there. Let us celebrate that with you and let us know how that works. 